What I want to do is I want to put up our last two points from last week. They did not end up in your bulletin. But they need to be covered. They are point 6B and 6C from last week. So what we're going to do is provide them for you electronically. You can see them on the overhead. Well, you'll be able to see it on the overhead in a minute, hopefully. 6B from last week. While that is getting put up, if you read with our elder, this is something that I mentioned two weeks in a row. There is a sort of repetitive theme that is repeated over and over again here in chapter 4. If you were paying close attention and reading with our elder, what you should have seen is the word rest repeated nine times. Nine times. That is not an accident. I said this before. Verse 1, if you have your Bibles, verse 1, rest. Verse 3, rest, two times. Verse 4, rest. Verse 5, rest. Verse 8, rest. <clears throat> verse 9, rest. And then verse 10, for the eighth time, he that has entered into his rest. The he there is Christ. The he there is Jesus Christ in verse 10. We talked about that last week. It's in the singular masculine in the original Greek language. It is uh, making a... <clears throat> slight distinction between the Lord Jesus Christ and his people. The Lord Jesus entered into his rest after he finished his atoning work at the cross, rose again from the grave on the third day, and is seated at the right hand of God, where he's ruling over the whole universe. And then verse 11, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that what? Rest. Rest. And we learned last week that rest is found only in a person. What's his name? the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus made this clear in Matthew chapter 11 verse 28. Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will rest you. I will rest you. So our rest is a person. I want you to write this down particularly if you weren't here last week. If you were here last week you, you probably got this. <clears throat> but Hebrews chapter 3 mentions three rests. Three rests. Two uh, ex exclusively, and the other one is pointed to. The other one is pointed to. Since we're talking about rest, what we want to understand is what the writer's aim is here. And the writer points to a rest back in the Genesis account. We spent a lot of time dealing with this last week called a what? A Sabbath rest, right? A Sabbath rest. And this is verse 3. It says, for we which have believed do enter into rest as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So he's talking about creation works. Bible believing Christians believe that God created the universe in how many days? Six days. We turn my volume down just a little bit more. Six days and God did what on day seven? That's exactly what this is talking about. He's talking about the creation by God, the triune God from the foundation of the world. And then he says in the next verse, which is explanatory, it says, for he spake in a certain place on the seventh day on this wise, God did what? Rest when? The seventh day from all is what? So in your categories, in your notes, the first rest here in view is the Sabbath rest, where God rested on day seven. We know that God didn't rest because he was tired. God is omnipotent. God has all power. He's omnipotent. He doesn't get tired. He was teaching us a gospel lesson. When God rested on day seven, he was teaching you and I to rest in Jesus Christ. Isn't that right? The seventh day, because we know the number seven is the number for perfection. The number seven is the number for perfect fullness. The number seven is God's number, not Las Vegas's. 777, right? That's God's number. So that's the first rest that's here in view. The other rest was the rest by which the people entered into the land of Canaan. If you go down a few verses, you can see here. And then can we get up Deuteronomy 12, verse 9, I believe it is. Why he's putting that up on the overhead. I know, son, you're going to have to go back and forth between verses and the point up there, but you'll need to get that. And then our 6B, you'll need to get that up on the overhead too. But if you notice, Paul, the, who we believe is a Hebrew writer here, mentions Sabbath rest, but then he fast forwards down the line to another rest where he says here in verse 5 in our text, and in this place again, if they shall enter into my what? Rest, right? And we learned last week and we learned when we went through chapter 3 
that the rest that the people of God ultimately entered into, and many of them failed to enter into, was the, the, less, the rest of what? The land of Canaan, right? Look up here, Deuteronomy 12, 9. Yeah, this is it. <clears throat> uh, Moses said to Israel, for you have not as yet come to the what? Rest and to the what? inheritance which the Lord your God gives you. What was the inheritance that the Lord God gave to national Israel in the Old Testament? The land of Canaan, a land flowing with milk and honey, right? So this is two rests, two rests, if you're taking notes. Rest one, God rested on the seventh day. And then M Moses records that in the book of Genesis, right? Israel then enters into the land of Canaan, which is rest number two. This is what our Hebrew uh, chapter 4 is talking about. But then check this out. Israel entered into the land of Canaan at about 1440 B.C. Remember, they were in the wilderness how long? 40 years, right? God called Moses to deliver them in 1490. 1490 B.C. approximately. And they were in the wilderness for 50 years. So 1490 minus 40 is what? Government, right? <laughs> 1450. 40 years, right? All right. So 1450, they enter into the land of Canaan and they enter into that rest, the second rest. But what happens is they enter into the land and almost 500 years later, a man named David writes Psalms 95. And David in Psalms 95 tells us that there's another rest to, to enter into. Which means that the land of Canaan and the Old Testament Sabbath rest was not the ultimate rest. They, listen, they only typified and pointed to a greater rest that's culminated in Jesus Christ. That's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Right, so the Sabbath day in the Old Testament was only a picture of the real rest. It's Jesus. The land of Canaan was not the ultimate rest. It was only a picture of the real rest, which is Jesus Christ. Let me make an application to ourselves. You want to make a connection this way. The Old Testament promised land was a foreshadow to the New Testament promise of the Spirit. The inheritance of Old Testament Israel was the land of Canaan. The inheritance for the New Testament church is the Holy Spirit. Isn't that what Ephesians 1 teaches us? Yes, and the Spirit of God is blood-bought, and the Spirit gives you and I a foretaste of the heavenly inheritance that we will ultimately experience when we get to heaven, right? So all of these rests were pointing to something greater in the New Testament. So can I get 6B up? 6B? We had two letters left on our outline from last week, and I need us to see these. We're talking about rest. We're talking about rest, and 6B... We're going to have to do a little bit better with that font. I don't think you guys can. Can you guys see that? You got to have young eyes to see that, don't you? The kids can see it. Asher, the, the kids sit next to you to interpret that. Okay. And let me tell you what it says. It says you are called, you and I are called to imitate the Lord in his rest. Does not the New Testament teach you and I to imitate God? Ephesians 5.1 says we are to be imitators of God. And we're to imitate God in this way, in his rest. In his rest. Look with me. Go down to verse 9 in your, in your text. <clears throat> it says, oh, uh, verse 8. The King James says, For if Jesus had given them rest, right? The name Jesus there should be translated Joshua. Remember, Jesus is the Greek equivalent to the name Joshua from the Old Testament. This is going from the, the Hebrew over to the Greek. But all of your newer translations say Joshua. It should say Joshua. Because Jesus and Joshua both mean salvation. Yehoshua, Jehovah is salvation, right? Right. So it, it, it should be read like this. If Joshua had given them rest. Because who led them into the land of Canaan? Good. That's what it's saying. <clears throat> if Joshua had given them rest, then would he not after would have spoken of what? Another day. So Joshua led them into the, their Canaan rest. And then 400 years later, one of God's holy prophets says, no, 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 this is not it. You have to keep looking forward. There's another rest to come in the New Testament. It's in Jesus. And it's only in Jesus that believers experience the heavenly rest. Y'all believe that? Do you know you're not going to heaven apart from Christ? Is that simple? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me, right? Okay, that ultimate rest can only be experienced through Jesus Christ. He's in verse 10. Look at verse 10. For he 
that is entered into his rest. Now, some of the newer translations might say they. It's more grammatically correct to say he because in the original language, it's in the singular masculine. It could be translated the one having entered into his rest. That one is Christ. You'll see because verse 10 focuses on, on one person. Look, for he that entered into his rest. Look at verse 11. Let us therefore. See that? See, see the uh, contrast there? So because of what Jesus did in verse 10, believers, this is what you're to do in verse 11. Now let me see this. Look at verse 10. For he that has entered into his rest, that's Christ, after he saved us at the cross, was resurrected, and is doing what at the right hand of God? He's sitting, right? We learned last week, because we, we, we went through some passages in the book of Revelation. Remember the chairs that are around the throne in heaven? And we learned that those chairs signify two R's. Who remembers? What and what? Rest and rule. Chairs and glory symbolize rest and rule. Remember, the book of Hebrews is, the, is about Jesus Christ being better. Jesus Christ being better than the Old Covenant, that Old Testament sacerdotal system. And what I taught us is in the Old Testament, there was never a chair in the tabernacle. Under the Old Covenant, there was never a chair in the temple. Because what it taught is under that old system of Judaism and legal works, in that sacerdotal system, the work would never be finished. Therefore, no one got to ultimately rest until Jesus came. Jesus came and fulfilled it all. Jesus came and satisfied it all. That's why it depicts Jesus as being seated at the right hand of God, entering into his session as king and ruler over the universe and resting because he finished the work. Jesus' last words on the cross were, it is what? Finished. That's right. For all those that believe on him. Now, Jesus is not the only one sitting at the right hand of God. And guess who else is sitting at the right hand of God? All believers are by faith positionally in Jesus Christ because where Jesus is, we are in him because he became everything that we are for us, right? All right, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> now, as we work this through, 6b, 6b, it says you are called to imitate the Lord in his rest. Did you know that, that when we rest, listen, we imitate the Son and we imitate the Father? Did y'all know that? We imitate the Son and we imitate the Father. When we rest in Christ, we're imitating the Father who rested on, on the seventh day, right? And when you rest in the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, you're also imitating him because he rested when he finished his works too, like Father, like Son, and Jesus says, my father worketh hitherto, and I work. Isn't that what he said? That's John 5, right. So we imitate both of them. We imitate both of them. Can we see Jesus' rest? Can I get up Ephesians 1.20? Jesus' rest, and then I have to say something to you <clears throat> um, that might be a little difficult to swallow, but I'm only here to tell you the truth, so we need to get at it. So I just want you to see one verse here, and then... I want to make a modern day application to ourselves in 2024. But notice since it says in Ephesians 1.20, <clears throat> talks about the resurrection of Christ. And it says, which he wrought in Christ, which God wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead. Do y'all believe that? Do you believe God raised Jesus from the dead? I do. I do. And set him at his own what? Right hand in the heavenly places. The right hand is a side of favor, honor, power, glory, favor, Right? That's where Christ is at the right hand of God. And we are too in him. We are too positionally in him. And one day we will be personally with him. Positionally in him. One day personally with him. Did everybody get that? This is what we look forward to. Now what we learned on Friday in Revelation. Revelation chapter 13. Because we're going through the Olivet Discourse. And we were uh, working our way through some verses in Daniel and in Revelation that would correspond with that. And what we learned, we were learning some of the MOs of the devil. And one of the MOs of the devil is he always tries to mimic God. One of the MOs of Satan is he always tries to mimic the true and the living God. Why? Because he wants your worship. That's why he was kicked out of heaven, Isaiah chapter 14, because he tried to exalt himself above the throne of God. Isn't that what the text says? Right. And so we have to deal with him while we're down here in this world, too, because he constantly tries to oppress and assault the believer. But he can't possess the believer. Did you know a Christian cannot be demon possessed? 
because Christians are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30. Ephesians 4.30. I'm so thankful. I'm thankful for that. But unfortunately, you and I have governmental entities and governmental authorities that think that they're God. That think that they're God. And they are single-handedly, incrementally taking away one freedom, one right, one liberty, one after the other. Even though uh, in most cases you and I have freedoms and, and liberties that are protected by our Constitution because we're a constitutional republic. But they're being stripped. How come? Because we have governmental leaders that want to be God. And absolute authority corrupts absolutely, doesn't it? Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Why? Because of the depravity of man's heart. And so many of these men are controlled by the wicked one rather than the true and the living God. And therefore, you know what they want you to do? Not rest in God, rest in them. Rest in them. This is where a lot of Christians are committing idolatry because they put their trust in politicians rather than in Jesus. Did you know the, new, uh, the, old, the old and New Testament, but the, the Old Testament particularly tells us in Jeremiah 17 verse 5 that if we put our trust in men rather than in God, we, we incur a curse upon ourselves. Cursed is the man who trusts in man, who makes flesh his arm, whose heart departs from the Lord. That's Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5. So we all have to assess ourselves. Am I trusting in Christ or am I trusting in politicians? Am I trusting in the gospel to, to, to fix my problems? Or am I, am I trusting in uh, uh, political agendas and schemes to solve my problems? See, that's the thing that we all have to be careful about. And then in a few months when we have to vote, we have to make sure that our voting does not violate the gospel. We have to make sure that our voting is not voting against Jesus. As a Christian, we just sing, I am his and he is mine. So therefore, that means you don't get to just do whatever you want to do. Right? You and I don't have carte blanche to just do whatever we want to do. If Christ bought us, we belong to him. And that means he owns us. And that means we have to, we have to go to him to make decisions. We have to say, like Saul said on the road to Damascus, Lord, what would you have me to do? We don't get to just do whatever we want. And you don't get to vote against Christ. We don't get to vote against Christ. That being said, we have a government that wants us to rest in them. You guys have heard of the Great Reset? The Great Reset, it's coming. It's coming. Our governmental authorities are working on what's called a Great Reset, where in 2030, so their aim is, none of us will own anything. And yet they claim we will be happy. And they will greatly, and, and I'm going to give you a resource where you can look this up on your own. I'm not wearing a tinfoil hat. They will greatly, listen, their goal is to greatly limit your ability to travel in the name of so-called climate change and global warming. Private ownership will eventually cease if they have their way. Drones will come into your neighborhoods to deliver everything that you need to your home. The government will also own and control everything. There, eventually, there will be no private property. You will have to simply rest in the government. They will control all aspects of society, and you will have to put all your rest and trust in them. And one of the masterminds of this is Klaus Schwab. Klaus Schwab at the World Economic Forum. And our president is behind it, too. I want you to write something down called a smart cities. How many of you have heard of smart cities? You will hear soon. You will. Um, smart cities, according to their agenda, are cities where you and I will be compacted in these small cities. And we listen, you will have to live within a within a 15 mile radius and you will be required to stay within that 15 mile radius. The goal is to get rid of all of our automobiles. The goal is to keep you and I from traveling. And the goal is to have us in this small, isolated place. Everything will be provided for you. In fact, their goal is also to control your food intake, too. Their goal is to make sure no one eats more than 2,500 calories a day. Some of us going to be in trouble when that happens. Right? Some of us going to be in trouble with that. Some, some of us might be benefited by that a little bit. Um, but no, that's not a good thing. That's total totalitarian governmental control. This is what happens when you go over into a socialist republic. Because when, the, when that happens, listen, the government becomes God. The government becomes God. And this is what they want. 
Moreover, let me just throw something else at you and then we'll keep it moving. Biden is supporting this also. And the goal is by 2030, the time of the Great Reset, that 30 percent of the land in the United States will be uninhabited. So it'll be the governments, they can control it. By 2050, 50% 50 of, of the land in the United States will be uninhabited and the government will be able to control it. We will all be fenced into small areas where they will control every aspect of our life in the name of us putting all of our rest and trust in, in the government rather than in God. We just have to be aware that these things are coming and we're going to need to speak out and stand for the truth because you and I are free men and women in Jesus Christ. Whoever the son shall make free shall be free indeed. The only one that has the right to govern your body and your soul is King Jesus and not the government. King Jesus and not the government. Moreover, they're, they're getting to a point now where they want you to rest so much that you don't even think. That's half church folk right there, right? Right, where they do your thinking for you, where they can put a microchip in your brain and do your thinking and calculating for you. Do you see the parody there? Because when God saves us, Romans 12, 2 says he renews us in the spirit of our mind. He transforms our mind. Well, the devil who mimics God wants to transform your mind too and make you over into his image. Don't you let anybody inject anything into your head. But God injecting his word into our head, into our heart. Let God write his laws in your mind. Let God write his laws into your heart. But don't give any other human being access to reprogram you. That's what they want to do. It's called transhumanism. The only person that gets to transform me is Jesus. He's the only one. He's the only one. Don't get me into government redistribution. That's where we're headed to. I need to move on. But that's where we're headed. That's where socialism is. They want to control all things. But it decreases production. When you take uh, uh, from those who work hard and earn and you take from them and you give to others who don't want to work, that's a, that's a violation of biblical principles, the principle of meritocracy. All through the, the uh, Proverbs talk about that. You, you decrease productivity because those who are working hard now see no reason to work. And then those who don't want to work really have no reason to work. So uh, productivity will go down. All in the name of just rest in the government. We rest in Jesus. We rest in Jesus. Let's move to our next point. I want to deal with a, an apparent paradox, but it's not. In the believer's life, the believer's life, you and I have to deal with paradoxes. Let me give you a paradox. We're simultaneously sinful and righteous at the same time, right? That's, a, that's not a contradiction. It's a paradox, right? We're righteous in Jesus, but we're a mess in ourselves, right? right? Are we messes in ourselves? Right, but we're perfect in Christ, right? We're headed to heaven where we will be perfect, but right now we're a work in process. Right. That's a paradox. But here's the paradox. Look at verse 11. And then we close out our point from last week. Look at verse 11. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into what? <laughs> labor to enter into rest. Kind of a paradox. Right. So did you know, child of God, that you're laboring and resting at the same time? Did y'all know that? Just reconcile that. True believers are laboring and also resting at the same time. What do you mean? You and I are to labor by doing good to others. You and I should have lives full of good works. Is that true? That ain't, that's not legalism. Can I get up Ephesians 2.10? That's not preaching works. Um, faith without error. That's faith without works is what? Dead. One of the evidences that you know you've been regenerated is you have a desire to do good to others. Uh, Jesus went about doing good everywhere he went, the Bible teaches us. And we're called to be followers of Christ. We should be doing good to other people too. So part of your prayer life is, Lord, Lord, put it on my heart and show me how I can do good to my fellow man. H how can I support others? How can I be a blessing to them? Is there anything I can do to support the church? Is there anything I can do to advance the gospel? That's, that should be your desire. God didn't save us for us to just sit around and do nothing. Yeah. Uh, look at Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Protologically, God in eternity past purpose that you and I would come into the world, be regenerated, and then show forth his glory by doing good to our fellow man. Doing good to our fellow man. This is what you and I are called to do. So the believer's life should be one of labor. Now see the word labor here in the King James. It, it really means to be diligent. 
That Greek word there means to be diligent. It means to make haste. Here's a good word. Be eager. Be diligent. Be eager. Here's a good word. It also means to fully apply yourself. Do you fully apply yourself to live for the glory of God? It's a good question, isn't it? Right. All of us can look in different areas in our life and say, you know what? I can apply myself better here. Right. I can apply myself better in this other area. I can spend more time reading God's word. That's probably all of us, right? I can spend more time praying. I could attend more prayer services. I can do better at getting to church on time. I can inculcate the word and try to share it with my fellow man. Who have I witnessed to on my job lately? How many neighbors have I talked to about Jesus? Have I shared Jesus with anybody at the gym? Are you guys following me? I've got unsaved people that are, that are uh, uh, un unsaved family members that are unsaved. I could be praying for them more and encouraging them, right? There's all kinds of things that you and I can be doing. So we're to labor in good works. True believers labor in good works. We labor in loving service to others. Here's another area. This is what you want to get good at. Ready? Write this down. Labor in fighting against sin. Labor to fight against sin. This is a fight we're all to be in. What sin? The sin within and the sin without. We got enough, enough sin left in our heart to fight until the last day, don't we? All right. Our biggest battle is within all of us, have, can I get up a verse, um, Jeremiah 17, 9? We're going to be turning to some places in a minute. Our hearts by nature are depraved. Our hearts by nature, your heart and mine, are wicked and evil by nature. This is why we need a new heart. I'm so thankful that Jesus Christ is our heavenly cosmic cardiologist. He takes out dead, unbelieving hearts, and he gives new, pure, believing hearts. Just ask him, he'll give you one. Just ask him. Notice what it says here. Now, I didn't write this. The heart, yours and mine, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can even know it? Who can even know it? That's God's assessment of your heart and mine. Okay. And the last thing, Proverbs uh, 28, 26, the last thing you want to do is trust that thing. That's the last thing you want to do is trust that thing. Right. And, and we're told in our modern culture, because we live in a very humanistic culture that tells us that man is basically good no man's the opposite man is basically evil that's why we need to be born again if we were good we wouldn't sin see how simple that is i'll leave that right there watch when it says here solomon the wisest man to ever live other than jesus guess what he said about it he said he that trusts in his own heart is a fool all right solomon's wiser than all of us in here right okay Trust in his own heart is, is, is a fool. So the last thing we want to do is trust in our heart. Don't trust your heart. Trust Christ. Don't look within for the answers. Look without to the Lord Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Don't look within. Look without. Don't look within. Look up to the Lord Jesus Christ. So, but when he gives us a new heart, that heart <clears throat> is desiring to do good to others. And it, and it labors, including laboring against sin, fighting against sin. You have to fight to continue to believe the gospel, don't you? Because you and I are constantly being bombarded with demonic influences in our world that would seek to get you to, to take a second look at this book and say, wait a minute, is this really the word of God? Right? Right. right. And, 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 and so that's why Paul says, fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith because you have an unbelieving world that influences you. You have an unbelieving devil that influences you. And you still have the remnants of unbelief in your heart if you're honest. No one has perfect faith. You keep coming to church because faith is a renewable commodity that grows and increases day by day as you continue to hear the word of God. This is one of the ways I know a person is truly saved. They're serious about being under the preaching of the gospel. I know that they're playing games when they're not serious about being under the preaching of the gospel. And I know they're serious about heaven when they're serious about doing those things that are necessary to nurture their faith and grow their faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's right. So we're laboring in all sorts of ways, but we're also striving to enter into the straight gate. So wrestle with me, and I'm going to close this part of the message out. Wrestle with me, okay? Um, positionally, we're in heaven, but personally, we're not. We're down here on earth. 
Jesus said that you and I are to strive to enter into the straight gate, right? He said that in Matthew 13, but I'm going to use a different verse right now. Uh, uh, Matthew 11, 12, I believe it is. It's not in your outline. I'm just thinking about it right now. If it's not there, if I misremember it, we'll, we'll just keep going. <clears throat> but true believers are in a fight to make it from here to glory. If you don't fight, you will not make it to heaven. That's not works. Watch this. Here it is. Yeah. Matthew eleven twelve. It says from the days of John the Baptist <clears throat> until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Take your pen out. Who is the violent? The believer, not violent against other people, not violent against political institutions, not physically violent in any way, spiritually violent, fighting against sin. Fighting to continue to believe the gospel. Fighting to not drift away from Christ. Fighting to stay on the narrow way and straight gate that leads unto life because there's so many influences to distract you and keep you from heaven's door. It's a constant fight, isn't it? Fighting in prayer for your children that God will save them. Fighting for your unbelieving spouse that doesn't believe the gospel. Wrestling with God in prayer. Saying, God, change his heart. Change your heart. Save him, Lord. Save him, Lord. Being a prayer warrior. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. And we don't get to stop until we get to heaven. The church on earth is the church militant. The church in heaven is the church triumphant. That's when you get to rest. So I'm hoping that this makes some sense to you. You and I must fight against our sin. We must fight for the good of our family. We must fight for the salvation of our children. We must fight against our own sinful hearts. We must fight against the world's influence and the world that wants to destroy our children. Teach them demonic educational things uh, and sexually pervert them in the schools and cut them up in a thousand pieces. Hint, hint. Hint, hint. We got to fight against all of those things. You have to fight against laziness to get up and come to church. You got to fight against laziness just to open your Bible and read. You have to fight against laziness that wants to tell you to, to quit and stop following Christ because it's too hard. Right? You got to fight against that. And you got to fight until you make it safe to heaven. Let's go to our first point on the outline. Those are the ones from last week. And we'll see how far we get on this part of the message. The title at the top of your bulletin, if you have it opened and you can look at the top left, here's, it's a uh, question for you. Which way will you be cut by this two-edged sword? Okay, we only have two more verses to consider for today. I'm going to read, read them to you. Verse 12, <clears throat> it says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that's not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. OK, so let's work our way through this. You only have one point. You have several letters. and We'll see how far we can get. Point number one is this. We have an all knowing soul penetrating word that will judge us all. When you read verse 12, it might be difficult to see how verse 12 shows up in the midst of all these other verses. Did you guys catch that when you were reading with the elder? Like, how did verse 12 fit in here, right? Well, how does that work? But we know the Spirit of God, uh, who owns all wisdom, knows exactly what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's doing. I want you to see why this verse is here, okay? Why is verse 12 here in the middle of all these verses? Well, the first thing I want you to know is verse 12 is connected with verse 1. Go back to verse 1. Why is God telling us in verse 12 that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of joints and marrow and soul and spirit? And it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Why is he saying that? Well, if you look at verse 1, it refers to... Um, Old Testament Israel and the New Testament believers that the writer is writing to. He says, look, let us, let us therefore fear. That's a healthy phobia. Let us fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest 
any of you should seem to come short of it. And then verse 2, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the what? Stop there. The what? There's your connection. Because he says the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, dot, 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 right? So I want to help you see this here. The connection uh, goes all the way back to verse 1 and 2. It actually goes back to chapter 3. I'll show you this in a minute. So what he's saying is, uh, verse 2, well, unto us the, the, the gospel was preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. It was not mixed in faith in them that heard it. What this is teaching us is the Old Testament saints heard the word like the New Testament saints are hearing the word. You are hearing the word of God right now. I'm reading it. We're turning it and we're putting it up on the overhead. I'm not giving you uh, my own feelings. Who cares what the pastor feels, right? Uh, too many churches focus on how the pastor feels. What does the Bible say, right? What does the word say? That's what, that's what you hear to hear, okay? All right, so th now that being said, what Paul is saying is the word was preached to Old Testament Jews and the word was preached to the New Testament Hebrews like the word is being preached to us. And what Paul is saying in verse 2 is that the word that was preached to them was not mixed with what? So God, through the discerning efficacy of the word that was preached to them, exposed the inner parts of their heart to reveal that there was not the presence of faith in their heart. The word of God is so penetrating like a samurai sword is able to fillet you open and expose what's really there in your heart. That's what he's saying. And so he's saying, be careful. Be careful how you hear because the hearers in the Old Testament were exposed by the living word, the discerning word that showed that there was no faith in their heart. And that same word is able to do that to us today. It's not a dead word. It's a living word, an active word that's able to open you up and reveal what's really there. Does that make sense? Now, now we can see why verse 12 is here. God's word is living. It's alive. So the motive for fear in verse 1 and the motive for diligence in verse 11 is the all discerning word with which we all have to do. All of us will be judged by this word. All of us will be judged by this word. The word is able to discern the heart's condition, isn't it? Go back to chapter 3. Let me show you why I say this. Go back to chapter 3. All of this is connected. It's not disjointed at all. Now, if you're back in chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 11, um, the Hebrew writer here is quoting from Psalms 95. And he says, so I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest, right? Israel did not enter into the rest of Canaan because they didn't believe the word, right? They perished in the wilderness. Now, verse uh, 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you, in any of you, an evil what? Heart of what? Unbelief in departing from the living God. The word of God is piercing and penetrating and able to open up what's really in your heart. Like right now, the, the spirit of God via the word has access to all of our hearts. Right now, he knows what all of you are thinking right now. He knows whether or not you're hearing the word and you're amening in your soul or just amening from your mouth. He knows it. He knows it. He knows if there's faith residing in your heart or, or callousness, deadness, and unbelief. He knows it. He knows it. This is what he's saying. So beware lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief because the word can get at that and expose it. Now go to verse 15. Then he says here, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. How come? Because the word can pierce down and see if your heart is hard. Harden not your hearts as in the what? Ah, listen, they're hard hearts provoked God because God via the word was able to see the hardness of it and it provoked him. Does that make sense? Same thing today. Same thing today. If you're listening to me right now here or you're listening to me right now from home and you're listening to the message and your response in your heart is unbelief, pray. Ask God to remove your unbelief because unbelief and hardness of heart provokes God to wrath in the New Testament just like it did in the old. 
So we all have to look at our hearts. How is my heart responding to the message right now? How is my heart responding to the message right now? Is it malleable and pliable and receptive to the truth? Or is it hard and calloused and dull and, and apathetic and unbelieving? If it is, ask God to help you. You can't hide. You can't hide. Our, our, our verse 13 teach, teaches us that. Okay? But, but notice this. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Look at verse 16. For some, when they had heard, did what? When they had heard, did what? <coughs> How did, they, how did they provoke him? In how they heard. In how they heard. Because they heard how? In unbelief. They, they heard with closed ears saying, no, God, we will not believe you. And therefore they perished. Does that make a little bit of sense? So go back to chapter 4 now. So it makes some sense contextually. The word that he's talking about in verse 12 corresponds with the word in verse 2 and the gospel in verse 2. It's all connected. That's what he means, okay? Now, let's run through these letters real quick so we can go, go home. Look at letter A. The written words, heart, discerning, efficacy. Okay? So, look at, look at verse 12. It says the word of God is what? <clears throat> quick. Uh, it says quick, right? That means living. If you want to know what these words means, it means living. It means living. It means it's alive. It's alive. Quick means living, not, not fast. <laughs> quick, living. And then it's what? Powerful. It means it's energetic. Energeos or inner energies is where we get the, from the Greek, where we get the English word energy. It's active and it's energetic. It's effectual and it works. And then it says it's what? Sharper. That means it's incisive. It's incisive. It's cutting. I'm going to show you this in a minute, okay? You guys see that sharper there? Tomoteros. Tomoteros is the Greek terms. It's more penetrating. It's more uh, incisive. It's more cutting than anything. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Two-edged sword or double edge. It can literally translate it two mouths. Two mouths. We'll talk about that shortly if we get to it. Okay. And it's double edge because it cuts on both sides. We're going to make applications to ourselves with that. Okay. Um, and then it says um, that it piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. If we get to it, I want to talk today about the difference between soul and spirit. They're not the same. There is a difference between your soul and your spirit. Hopefully we'll get there today. And, it's, and it gets down into the joints and marrow. It means it gets down to the deepest, most recess uh, uh, parts of your anatomy. It gets all the way down to the core of your being and is a discerner. See it? It's a discerner. Of the thoughts and intents of your heart. In other words, ready? It's able to discover what's going on in your heart. It's able to discover and reveal what's really going on inside of your heart. We can hide from each other, but we can't hide from God. Now, let me show you how the word does this. Turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians 14. Here's a beautiful place that we can go. Now, there's a lot of places we can go for this. A lot of times when Jesus would preach in his ministry, people would be, would be irate with him, right? Because the word was exposed. It was pulling their skirts up, wasn't it? And it was exposing what was in their heart. That's why when he preached at Nazareth, they tried to kill him by pushing him over the edge of a cliff. Remember? Because he was preaching truth, not because he was lying. Now, 1 Corinthians 14, is everybody there? I want you to see this. Now, Paul is governing the, speak, the, the gift of speaking in tongues, which we do not have today. Which we do not have today. Okay, that's an argument for another time. We've talked about that before. It was a very important gift during the first century. It was necessary to communicate the gospel to different people groups to get the gospel to the four corners of the world. Uh, but the Bible is translated in all different languages now. And the Bible is complete. There's no need for that. But at the time, they were using it, but they were misusing it. Listen, they were focusing more on that gift than the simple gift of simply explaining the scriptures. Paul says, no, I want you to focus on that. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. Faith can't come by hearing if you don't know what the minister's saying, right? All right, look at verse 24. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14. Yes, verse 24. Paul says, but if all prophesy, which is what I'm doing now. I'm not foretelling the future. That, that's primarily not what he's talking about here. It's preaching the word, explaining the word, expositing the word, right? He says, but if all prophesy, watch this, and there comes in one that believes not. 
There comes in a person to church who doesn't really believe the gospel. For whatever reason, they're here, they're here. God ordained them to be here. They might not even want to be here, but they're here. And the word is being preached. Okay? And he said, there comes in one that does not believe or one who's unlearned. He is convinced of all and judged of all. That means the word of God, because it's penetrating, cutting, illuminating, convicting, and is able to open that person's heart to show them what they really are and show them their unbelief. Show them their sin. What's the first work of the Holy Spirit? When the spirit of truth has come, he will convince the world of sin. John 16, 8. John 16, 8. But it takes the word to do that. It takes the word to do that. That's why we need to be under the preaching of sound expository Bible teaching, because it's God's word that does that. It's designed to show them their sin, their guilt, and then show them a savior who can help them, who can help them. In fact, who's already come and dealt with the problem by dying on the cross in their place where they should have been. If they just repent of their sins and put their trust in him, they can have salvation. But this is. The way that God will work only through the word. Verse 25 through the preaching, it says, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest it. The secrets of his heart are made manifest. And so if God is, is saving that person, it says, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. You know, sometimes you come to church and you're like the pastor was talking to me, right? He was talking directly to me. Anybody ever experienced that before? He was talking to, put your hand up. That's right, all of you, yeah. Right, he was talking directly to me. How could he have known? Right, he's got microphones in my living room. No, he doesn't, but God does. Right, he knows what you're doing in the dark. He knows what you do when you're not here the other six days during the week. I don't know. Right, right. And, and, and so he's able to, to deal with you uh, imperceptibly, personally. Where you know it's just him talking to you. All right, Lord, you, you got me. <laughs> you got me. All right, I need, to, I need to stop doing that. Help me, Lord. Right? God is being good to you when he does that. Right. So that's important. Uh, uh, put up Proverbs. Uh, no, I'll just quote it. it Proverbs 6.23. What we're talking about is how the word is like a mirror. The commandment, God's word, is a lamp. And the law is a light. And reproofs of instruction are the way of life. God's word is light. It shows you your real condition. It shows you and I what we really are. One more verse. Um, James 1, 22. James 1, 22. I want to get that up on the overhead. Paul said in another place regarding the law, he says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in God's sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The word of God is like a mirror to show us our sin. One of the things we talked about at Union Gospel Mission last week is John the Baptist's ministry. And when he ministered, y'all remember he wore a funny outfit? Looked like a hippie from the 60s, right? With the camel's hair and all that. It was a The camel's hair was a mirror to the people. Because a camel was an unclean animal according to the old dietary law. Right. So every time they came out to see John and they saw his outfit and they saw the camel's hair, they were seeing a mirror of their own uncleanness. Because the word of God is like a mirror. John's ministry was like a mirror. And the word of God is designed to be a mirror to show you your sin. But then also to show you a savior for your sin, to show you Christ. Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. Okay. James 1.22, I'll be quick here. James says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Lord, help us with that, right? Deceiving your own selves. Ouch. Look at verse 23. Ouch. Did you feel that? <laughs> verse 23, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. The glass is the word of God. It's designed to show you your condition so you can get your condition fixed by coming to the physician to fix your condition by the righteousness of Jesus Christ, who's in the business of fixing broken sinners. Right. Right. In a glass. And then look at verse 24. We'll keep it moving. Verse 24. For he beholds himself and goes his way and straightway forgets what man of man he was. Lord, help us not to do that. 
You don't want to leave hearing the preaching of the gospel that way. When God shows you yourself, then you want to work on yourself. That You want to look to Christ to fix you and, and, and look to Christ to grow you and refine you and mold you and shape you into his image. But you don't turn away and continue living in rebellion and living in sin. Because on Judgment Day, we won't be able to blame God. He's going to say, no, remember I showed you your face in the mirror? I showed you. I showed you. All right, let's, let's go back to our text. We are getting close to our time for today. Please go back to Hebrews chapter 4. <clears throat> we got about 12 minutes, so let's see what we can get done in that little bit of time. Uh, as you're working your way back, oh, I'm so thankful we made it to this letter. Okay, you guys in Hebrews chapter 4, we are in letter B. So I need you to see two things here, okay? Listen to me, verse 12. Hebrews 4, 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful, and then it goes on, right? I want you to see two things here. Number one, the word of God here, as we just saw, is referring to the inscripturated word. The inscripturated word, but that's not all. The term word here is referring to the inscripturated word, but it's also referring to the incarnated word. The incarnated word. Who is that? Jesus. Is Jesus the word? Can we get it? John 1 1. John 1 1. Many of you know it by heart. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And the word was God. And verse 14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Right? So the word is a person. It's a person. Yep, you can see it. All right, the word is a person. Let me, let me develop this so you can see it. Because there's personal attributes implied here. First, go back to verse 7. It says, <clears throat> and again, he limits a certain day. Saying, in David, today, after so long a time, as it is said today, if you will hear his what? Voice. Doesn't that imply a person? Yes. And then in verse 12, it says the word. We just saw that Jesus is the word. Look at verse 13. Verse 13 is still talking about the word from verse 12. It says in verse 13 about the word, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, not its sight, his sight. You guys see that there? And then at verse 13, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes. Eyes. That's a person of him with whom we all have to do. Do y'all see it? Right. This is Christ, and this is the word incarnate, the word personified. Don't we all have to do with him on the last day? We all have to stand before him. Turn with me now. Now we're considering the omniscience of Jesus. And so you want to write this down. We're considering two things, the omniscience of Jesus. And listen, Jesus being like a sword. Jesus being like a sword. So turn with me to Isaiah 49. So you can see in your own Bible. That Jesus is referred to as being like a sword. Now we know he's the incarnate word. And we know the inscripturated word is called the sword of the spirit. Sword of the spirit, isn't it? Ephesians 6, 17. Yeah. So you're making your way to Isaiah 49, hopefully. <clears throat> and while you're in, you're going to turn to Isaiah 49. And I want to get up John 2, 23. On the overhead. Okay. This word that we're reading in Hebrews 4. Is described as knowing everything. Okay. All things are open and naked unto the eyes of him. With whom we all have to do. Okay. So it's describing Jesus. Does the Bible describe Jesus in other places as being omniscient? Yes. Yes. John 2.23. Uh, uh, <clears throat> it says now when he. Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day. Many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Verse 24. Then it goes on to say here. <clears throat> but Jesus did not commit himself unto them. Because he what? He's omniscient. If he knows all men, he's God. You can't be a mere man and know all men and not be God. <laughs> right. And in verse 25. Verse 25 tells us, it says, and referring to Christ, he needed not that any should testify of man. For he knew what was in man. That makes Jesus God, doesn't it? 
of course. And it makes him one of the omnis of God. This is what we would refer to in theology as an incommunicable attribute. An incommunicable attribute. He is all-knowing. None of us are, but he is, right? So, but he's also like a sword. Isaiah 49, if you guys are there, uh, the uh, prophet Isaiah prophesying of the coming of Christ. And actually, this is beautiful because this is actually Jesus talking in the Old Testament, which shows he's eternal. Look at verse one. This is Christ talking. Hopefully you can hear his voice. Listen, O isles. This would be the distant nations and Gentiles of all people. Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken you people from afar. The Lord has called me. That's the Father calling the Son. The Lord has called me from the what? So this is referring to Christ's eternal calling as our mediator and Savior, and it's referring to his incarnation. Wasn't Jesus born of a virgin? The Spirit of God formed the human nature of Jesus in Mary's womb. But before that, Jesus was in existence because Jesus created Mary. That's right. And so it says, from the womb, from the bowels of my mother has he made mention of me. Right? Now here's our verse. And he has made my mouth like a what? You see it? See it? Does that connect with our verse in Hebrews chapter uh, uh, 4, verse 12? The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It does. It does, right? This is the mouth of Christ. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword because his word pierces and it penetrates. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And it, they're able to penetrate to the heart in a double-edged way, which we're going to deal with in a minute. And then he says, in the shadow of his hand has he hid me. This is Christ being concealed until his incarnation and concealed until he began his, his public ministry. And then he says, he hid me and he made me as a what? Polished shaft, like a sharpened arrow, like a sharpened arrow. In his quiver has he hid me. So Jesus is like God's arrow and God, like a bow, shot our glorious Savior into the world to hunt down hellbound sinners and save them. God is our heavenly Cupid. Isn't that right? That God is our heavenly Cupid. He's so good to us. <clears throat> He's so good to us. Okay. Now, along the, uh, the uh, thought of a sword, turn to Revelation chapter 1. Let's see our uh, uh, post-resurrected glorified savior <clears throat> revealed here in revelation chapter one now you're turning to revelation chapter one can we get up deuteronomy 33 29 on the overhead <clears throat> then i want to wrap this up. this might be as far as we get <clears throat> today and that's that's okay uh so you're turning to revelation chapter one <clears throat> now watch how the lord is referred to even in the old testament you're, then when you get to Revelation 1, just hold it there. <clears throat> We're going to start wrapping up here in a second. I just want you to see something. Watch how Jehovah in the Old Testament is referred to. And Jesus is Jehovah. Jesus is Jehovah. <clears throat> notice it says, oh, that they were wise. Uh-uh, no, this is, no, 30, 33, 29. <clears throat> That's a good verse too, though. Yes, okay. It says, Happy are you, O Israel, who is like unto you, O people saved by the Lord. Watch how it describes the Lord. The shield of your help is God our shield. And who is the sword of your excellency? God is the sword that protects us. God is the, the sword that destroys all of our enemies and foes. The sword in the scripture is also a symbol, symbol of capital judgment, capital punishment. God destroyed our enemies, namely the devil and all of the dark demonic hosts that seek to destroy our souls. And they were pierced through by the crucifixion of Jesus Christ at the cross. Were they not? That's right. That's right. So God here is being described as being like a sword. Jesus in Isaiah 49 is being described in the same way. And in Revelation 1, Christ has a sword coming out of his mouth. Look at Revelation chapter 1. <clears throat> then we're going to wrap up with this point. We'll do the other letters next week. Okay. Revelation chapter 1, John sees this vision of the glorified Jesus Christ. And I think I'll start at verse 12. Revelation chapter 1, verse 12. <clears throat> John says, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me. How do you turn and see a voice? 
How can you see a voice unless it's the incarnated word, the word of God? Christ is the voice of God incarnate, right? I turn to see the voice that spake, spake with me and being turned. I love that. I turn because I was being turned. Same thing with repentance. It's our responsibility to turn. But if you turn, it's because you're being turned. You're being turned. God turns us. All right. Then it says, in being turned, I saw the seven golden candlesticks. Those are the seven churches of Asia Minor. The church is the candlestick. You are the light of the world, right? We're the candlestick. We're not the light in and of itself. When it says we're the light of the world, we're light bearers. Christ is the light that shines through us, right? Okay. Verse 13. And I saw in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto who? The Son of Man. Now, many times in the scripture, when you see the term Son of Man, that nomenclature refers to his humanity, and that's true. But not only. The term Son of Man is also a term that underscores deity, too. It re- the term Son of Man refers to Jesus' messianic role. The Messiah, the God-man. In your own time, read Daniel 7. You'll see it used there, too. You'll see it used there, too, okay? <clears throat> so this is him uh, uh, in his uh, divine messianic role, okay? And then he says, unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. What kind of garment is that? High priestly attire. That's going to help us wrap up our message. Listen, high priestly attire. Do we have a high priest at the right hand of God? Who's entered into the heavens for us? Okay. Remember that because I'm going to close with making a comment about that. And we're going to go eat. Then it says in verse 14, his head and his hairs were white like wool. Now people twist this verse up so bad. So bad. It doesn't say that his hair was wool. That's not what it says. I've heard people say that to try to prove. Well, see, Jesus is African-American because his hair was wool. Therefore, his hair was nappy. So therefore, Jesus is black. He's from Africa. That ain't what that's saying. That's not what that's saying. You know, every culture depicts Jesus in, 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 uh, to look just like them, no matter what, where they come from. <laughs> right? Why don't we just let Jesus be the Lord of glory and leave it at that? <laughs> All right. All right. So how do we understand this? Look, his, verse 14. Listen, listen. His head and his hairs. So what you going to do with that? It says his head was white. All right, so you got a white head, but he's African-American. How you going to make that work? Right? Right. This Re- the book of Revelation is hyper-symbolic. It's not to be interpreted literal. So this is what you want to get. His head and his hairs were white like wool. Not wool, white like wool. It means he's the ancient of days. That's what it means. The hoary head denotes his ancientness and his eternality. That's what it means. His goings forth are from everlasting to everlasting. He's eternal God. That's what it's saying. Everybody get that? All right. And then it says here, uh, a white as snow, uh, were white like wool, as white as snow, and then it says, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. That refers to his all-seeing, all-knowing, all-piercing eyes, being able to see everything and pene- penetrate through everything to see what it really is. Fire penetrates through it all. Okay, that's his omniscience. That's what our text is saying back in Hebrews 4. Okay, and then he goes on to say here, verse uh, 15. You only have a couple more verses to go. In his feet. Like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. Okay, burned, in the Greek it's in the perfect verb tense. It refers to a completed action that has continuous ongoing results. So what it's pointing out to us is the fact that Jesus went through the fiery, white, hot, wrath of God and successfully came out on the other side as our triumphant savior. Aren't you thankful? That's his resurrection. He went through the fire of God. God by nature is a consuming fire. Christ went through that for us so we wouldn't have to see it for a second. I'm happy about that. I'm happy about that. I used that as a witnessing tool when I was at the gym yesterday uh, coming out of the sauna 
and I had a chance to uh, strike up a conversation with the guy. I said, this sauna reminds me how precious Jesus is because as hot as this sauna is, hell is infinitely hotter than this. It makes me thankful that I don't have to go through the heat of God's wrath because Christ went through it for me. I'm thankful for them little opportunities to get to the gospel. That's what we're to be when we're out in the world. Look for opportunities to get to the gospel. Tell people about Christ. All right, let me hurry up. He went through it for us. And it says, as if they burned in a furnace. The furnace is the wrath of God. And his voice has a sound of many waters, loud and great and terrible and awesome because it's the voice of God. Now, here's our verse. Verse 16. And he had in his right hand what? Now, what in the world is that? Write it down. The seven stars are the seven ministers, the seven pastors of the seven churches. That's what the stars are there. The seven stars there are the seven angels, which are the seven ministers, not angels like heavenly messengers. The term angel means messenger. Angelos in the Greek, messenger. Okay. Well, in fact, look at verse 20, so you don't have to take my word for it. Go to verse 20 real quick. The mystery of the, of the what? Seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. The seven angels of the seven churches are the pastors, the teachers of those churches, because God's pastors are not angelic beings. That's not what it's saying. The angels mean that they're messengers. God's pastors are his messengers. Does that make sense? Okay. And it says the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. So the candlesticks are the churches. Look, and the seven candlesticks which you saw are the what? Are y'all looking at the verse? Go to verse 20. The last part of verse 20. And the seven candlesticks which you saw are the seven what? Churches. Churches. Right. Okay, go back to verse 16 because I need to show you the sword and then we can go home. It says, and he had in his right hand seven stars. That means Christ is Lord over the ministers of his church. And therefore, he's the Lord over the church. Not the pastor, Christ. Christ. And it says, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. See it? That's the sword we're talking about in our text. Jesus is not walking around with a literal sword hanging out of his mouth. I, please don't understand it that way. It's symbolic. When Christ comes back, he's not coming back with a sword dangling out of his mouth. Okay? That's kind of silly. It's symbolic. Okay. The sword denotes two things. The sword coming out. If it's, listen, if it's coming out of his mouth, that has to do with a word. If it's coming out of his mouth, it has to do with his word. And it has to do with this powerful, authoritative word to either give life or to bring judgment and death. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are that's one edge of the sword. And those that reject the gospel will be ultimately condemned by the sentence out of Jesus' mouth unto eternal what? Death. This is why we'll have to deal with it more next week. But this is why the sword is called double-edged. Double-edged. For some it cuts unto life. And some it cuts unto death. The gospel is a savor of life unto life. And death unto death. Isn't that 2 Corinthians chapter 2? That's right. I was hoping to get to that today, but we won't. So let's go back and, 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 and stop. I think we're good for today. Let's go back and I need to stop, please. Please go back to Hebrews. I'm going to end by saying this. Go back to Hebrews for here's my, my closing thought for us today. We'll pick this up next week, Lord willing. All right. I want you to see the connection between verse 12, verse 13 and verse 14. Verse 12, it says the word of God. Right. We're considering that as the incarnate word, Jesus. Verse 13. Neither is there any creature that's not manifest in his sight. That's Christ. The word in verse 12 and the word in verse 13 is also talking about the same person in verse 14. Look at verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. Do you see it? The word in verse 12 is the high priest in verse 14. The word uh, or the his and the him and the eyes of him in verse 13 is referring to the high priest in verse 14. It's not disjointed. It's all referring to the same thing. And so it says that seeing them, we have, we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. That's what we're seeing him in Revelation 1. The glorified high priest that rules it all. 
Jesus, the Son of God, and as a result, let us hold fast our profession. So, where's the connection between the high priest in verse 14 and the sword in verse 13? Glad you asked. Did you know that the high priest in the Old Testament, ready? Listen, the high priest in the Old Testament was a butcher. Did you guys know that? He was a butcher. Leviticus chapter 1. Don't go, just going to put it on the overhead because I, I told you I'm going to stop. Leviticus 1.5. I'm really just war- I'm really just warming up, I, but I'm being nice. We're gonna stop. Like, I don't want to go nowhere, right? It's good to be here. It's good to be in God's word in the presence of Christ. I really want to just stay here all day. <laughs> I want to, but notice this. I want you to see the connection. There's not a disjointed uh, reality where he mentions verse uh, a high priest in verse 14 and a sword in verse 13. They go together. Leviticus 1, uh, 5 and 6. Look. <clears throat> Leviticus is talking about the, uh, the Levitical priesthood and their sacrifices, the sacrifices. It says, he shall kill the bullet before the Lord and the what? The priests. And Aaron's sons shall uh, bring the blood and sprinkle the blood round about the altar. That is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, right? Uh, these are the, the priests killing the animal and in, and, and in doing what they're supposed to do in that sacerdotal system. Verse 6. <clears throat> he shall flay the burnt offering. The priest. Flay it. That means skin it. Skin it. Like. Our Savior was sacrifices open in order to give uh, God his part and to allot to the priests their part and to cut open the sacrifice all the way down to the bone to discover the nature of it, whether it be good or bad, qualified or unqualified, acceptable or un- unacceptable, which is what Jesus is doing today even now. Even now. Exposing what's in our heart. You are the sacrifice. That's Romans 12, 1. A living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. And when the word comes down, as is being preached today, what will Jesus find when he looks in your heart? What will Jesus find when he looks in your mind and looks in your soul? Will he find someone believing on the Lord Jesus Christ? Or will he find someone that's rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ? He knows your every thought, your intent, your will, your motive. He, he tries the reins and he discerns the spirits. He weighs the heart, the Proverbs says. So what's the application? I'm going to give you four quick things. Knowing this is the result, four things this should teach us because you can't hide from God. All things, that's verse 13, all things are open and naked unto him. Four applications. Number one, be real with Christ. Just be real. He already sees it. Be real. Be real. Lord, I don't believe you. I don't believe your word. Be honest. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Help me to believe. Be real with him. Number two, be confessional. Confess your sin. He already sees it. If you confess now, he'll forgive you. If you confess on, the, on judgment day, it'll be too late. Confess now and get forgiveness. Number three, just be honest with God. I'm saying basically the same thing. Just be honest. Honest people who are honest with Christ won't go to hell. And lastly, be believing. Be believing. He sees our hearts. And the writer here tells us to be weary of an evil heart of unbelief. If you have unbelief in your heart, Christ can fix it. Say, Lord, take out my unbelieving stony heart and give me a heart of flesh. And he'll do it. Won't he? God bless you. Amen. Amen. All right. We will uh, have our offering and then have our music team come up. And sing our last song.